Thank you very much for that generous introduction. <coughs> um, you should have one of these in front of you. You should be able to see it just so that you can uh, see how close we are to the end. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a very long conclusion. Um, so it's, it starts about halfway in, so it's just to keep you interested. Um, uh, uh, thank you for coming. I really am flattered by the turnout tonight. I thought end of term and all of that, I thought it was going to be a case of two or three gathered together. I'm particularly grateful to a couple of my students here who I would have thought have heard quite enough of me this semester. But have come again, thank you. Uh, I should say that actually tonight I'm filling in. Uh, we had hoped to uh, have stage another event uh, around about now. Plans for that fell through. Uh, and so I'm stepping into the breach. It just so happened that I did have something ready. I had this ready <coughs> because um, over Easter I was away <coughs> in uh, the Lebanon where there was a, a conference held by the church at Middle East University uh, and it was called the Translatable Gospel. And the question really was whether uh, that gospel in which we believe can possibly tr be translated to the wider world. And Middle East University being situated in Beirut uh, was a very good place to have it because Beirut, as you are well aware, is a kind of crossroads of um, cultures and civilizations and has been for uh, many, many uh, centuries, uh, millennia even. Uh, I, w I could quite as easily be uh, talking tonight about the experience of being in Lebanon. Uh, it's just, uh, just over a week since I was literally on the road to Damascus, uh, which uh, we were within about five miles of the Syrian border, which was just getting a little bit too close for comfort. There were, there were armed soldiers, on Lebanese soldiers, on the streets and pretty mo much everywhere we went. The British Embassy did advise against going where we went, but I felt perfectly safe. I suppose I was in a tourist bubble, uh, in a tour bus, but some of the things I saw did disturb me. Um, Syrian refugee camps, people who just kind of come over the mountains to keep safe. Uh, and Palestinian um, refugee camps, which are much more settled, but no less poverty stricken. Um, very rich country, completely self-sufficient in food, remarkably. Uh, cuisine was good. Um, incredible archaeological sites. We were at Tyre and Sidon, place of um, the location of one of my favourite gospel stories, Matthew 15, the Syrophoenician woman. We were in the heart of Canaan, um, land flowing with milk and honey, and I can believe it. It's very potentially hugely rich country. Um, modern day Lebanon is part of what would have been called Galilee. Um, and there is uh, um, a small um, t town in Lebanon called Cana. So it could just be that John chapter 2 is located there. Anyway, I won't go on about that. But it was really, for me, quite a remarkable experience. I felt something moved inside me. I'm not quite sure what it was, and I'm still processing the experience. But it was, for me, an important experience. Enough of that. Um, my task at the um, conference, uh, it was Adventist academics, um, talking about the translatable gospel, and I was asked to address the subject of the theology of pluralism. And I explained right at the beginning, this is a little unfortunate because I'm not trained in theology, um, uh, but rather in philosophy. So this is a kind of philosophical uh, approach to the whole question of whether the gospel is translatable in a plural society. Uh, dangerous to say that because it, my experience in my social life is that as soon as I mention the word philosophy and that I teach philosophy, people go kind of they glaze over and try to get out of the conversation as quickly as possible because people have not done it at school here in this country uh, and they think it's terribly difficult and abstruse and really not very interesting, which is quite the reverse of what's true. 
Uh, and so I'll, I'll try and make this um, as accessible as possible. This is a r slightly re w reworked version uh, of what I did over there. It's not that much. Uh, and it will consist, if you look at this, you can see uh, that after a few preliminaries, I will tell three stories uh, in good philosophical tradition. Um, Plato did it, so why shouldn't I? Um, and then I'm going to look at secular pluralism, religious pluralism, Christian pluralism and Adventist pluralism. Uh, just brief comments on all of those things uh, and then work through to a conclusion which contains my own convictions about uh, trying to do mission in um, a plural society. So I reckon it'll probably take about 45 minutes. So you can uh, see, uh, you can plot our progress. Um, I began by saying that the, the very situation in the room in which we found ourselves uh, illustrates the problem, and it does here as well. Uh, even in this group here today, we face uh, a, the problem that many things get lost in translation. Um, we do not fully understand each other, even when we think we do. Um, even when we have so much in common because of our different usages of the English language, our different understandings of the English language and the limitations of the language itself. Rich though the English language is, uh, it of course contains limitations, not able to encapsulate particular concept, religious concepts. That's really not a very good prospect at all as you try to talk about the translatable gospel. Uh, but it may be that these kinds of limitations um, will uh, teach us some important things about the problem of translating the gospel to those who have a little of the shared understanding that, uh, that we do. Um, translation, good translation, requires the play of the imagination. Um, you can see that uh, if you look at uh, subtitles on television. Um, some some um, television programs which are pre-subtitled uh, come up with very stilted uh, translations. Uh, very odd things happen. And if you've ever watched um, any kind of um, subti any subtitles to a sporting event where the translation is uh, spontaneous or even done electronically, you know that subtitles throw up all kinds of nonsense. Um, and so, uh, and if you go into hotel rooms in foreign countries, they, they have some very curious English as well. So uh, I'm I want to explore this question uh, of, of pluralism via the question of the imagination. The, the imagination requires the capacity to see th that things may be other than we have con uh, conceived them to be, that relations between things may be construed in ways different from the ones that we've always used. And this I in a simple way is the very heart of pluralism. It is about the legitimacy of the demand of the other, that which is other, on our attention. And if you put this in the context of the translatable gospel, it asks this question. How much can I approximate my understanding of the gospel in order to communicate effectively to that other, to those people from other traditions, and yet retain loyalty to uh, the tradition. Um, in other words, how, how rough can the translation be before it becomes kind of inaccurate and laughable? Uh, I wanted uh, in the conference and now to uh, insist on several uh, procedural rules uh, as fundamental to progress. Um, and they may seem obvious, but they're not always obvious in an Adventist uh, context. The first is, this topic is threatening. Uh, it's threatening to us, and so we need consciously to try to put to one side our fear of that which is other. Defensiveness against all of those who disagree with us, uh, 
put to one side those exaggerated concerns about our own identity, which, uh, which uh, the church gets very absorbed with, and also any uh, great anxiety about maintaining Adventist market share. All of those, I think, distort our judgment and we need to try and put them to one side. That's the first thing, to recognise that we, there may be some fear in all of this for us. The second is that we need uh, to do, uh, we need as honestly as we can to consider the evidence before us without too much special pleading. Uh, and we must recognise at the same time, this is always qu quite difficult for anybody who's committed to a particular tradition. Um, because we always want to uh, give precedence to our own particular understanding uh, of this case in the, of the Gospel. Third, uh, lest anybody at this stage should be beginning to uh, be anxious uh, about the subject, I think we should have um, an open and modest confidence in our own community of faith. Fourthly, I think we should feel no pressure to move away from our faith commitments, none at all. But we should certainly feel an obligation to deepen them. So my argument is that we shouldn't, we, we, we're not moving away from Adventism, but we need to move, we have an obligation to, to go down deeper than we traditionally do. And we also uh, need to recognise that um, th progress in this kind of area is made by collaborative effort, not competitive effort. Uh, and you know as well as I do that uh, theology can easily become a kind of competitive sport. Um, and it's not very pretty or useful, frankly. <coughs> so I'm going to argue that the imagination can take us to places beyond where traditional theology and philosophy leave us. Uh, and I will further argue that the future of our church, the health of our church, depends on keeping the Adventist imagination alive and well. So I want to begin by asking you to use your imaginations. I have created three stories. Um, philosophers often use stories to deal with difficult areas. Um, and so I hope uh, if, if you get a bit lost later on, you come back to work with the stories because they've, they've got various kinds of meaning. So the first story is about the most wonderful wife in the world. Um, imagine, if you will, that you get involved uh, in a conversation uh, tonight and conversation turns to our families and most specifically our wives. One of us sings his wife's praises, that she keeps the home spotlessly clean, that she produces exotic cuisine, that she caters effortlessly for numerous guests, that she nurtures your children lovingly, in truth is a better preacher than you are, that she plays the harp extremely well, that she does good oil paintings, that she goes jogging every morning, and most importantly, she shows you, her husband, tender attentiveness. This colleague concludes that he has the most wonderful wife in the world. I suggest to you that it is unlikely that at that point another colleague will jump up angrily and claim that this is untrue because it is in fact he who has the most wonderful wife in the world. It is unlikely that this second colleague will say that you would expect all of these qualities in an averagely good wife, but that in addition his wife has just completed a doctorate in Aramaic runs marathons and can strip down the engine of a car. What a frightening woman that would be. It's unlikely that uh, other people will join in the contest and that this will all end in hostilities because we can live happily with the idea that the title, the best wife in the world, can be awarded to many women because it is not a judgment of fact but an assertion of personal commitment, a subjective, not an objective claim. The first colleague is in fact saying that his wife is uniquely suited to partner him through life. 
The story of the most wonderful wife in the world argues that if our commitment in our personal relationships is absolute but subjective, why could that not also be true of our religious commitments? If we can live happily with colleagues who claim that their wife simply is above all others in virtue, why can we not live happily with others who claim that their God or their way is above all others in virtue in the same way? Why do we feel that we are involved in some sort of spiritual struggle to defend and promote our view of the Eternal One? Translation of the colleague's claim is simply not necessary on this, uh, on this view, though the conversation might be interesting. That's story one. Story number two. Uh, the next two stories are set in uh, medieval Catholic settings. Uh, and I've done this because I, I think sometimes it's easier to recognize truths about your own community of faith coming at it obliquely via another tradition. So these remote Catholic settings may help us to address our predicament. Um, imagine, if you will, a medieval monastery at the heart of which is a cloister. Amazingly enough, these religious institutions have at their heart an open and quiet space. Uh, there's a, a lesson in that, but I won't go down that particular a root. Think about it though, at the heart of a religious institution, an open and quiet space. The monks uh, have cells which look down on the cloister and one day the abbot of the uh, monastery decides to install a sculpture in the middle of the cloister to aid reflection. When one monk first sees it from his cell, he describes it as being in the shape of an S. Another monk whose cell is on the opposite side of the cloister sees it as being a reverse S. Still another monk whose cell is on a third side of the cloister says that it's simply a straight vertical shape. And a fourth monk whose cell is opposite the third agrees with him. So you get the picture of a four-sided cloister with people looking down on this object and seeing it uh, from different angles and therefore differently. If the four monks were to come down into the cloister, they would come to understand that all their descriptions are correct. The shape of the sculpture looks different according to which cell window you view it from. The different accounts actually describe the same reality. It is simply that each of the monks is viewing it from the perspective of their own selves. The story of the cloister says that if the location of our own personal cell is so crucial in determining what we see down there in the public space of the cloister, may it not be that when it comes to religious re realities, that perspective is all. That no one is able to give an exclusive account of what the sculpture represents, nor of what reality is like. It is what it is. It demands no inter interpretation, no translation is necessary. So that's the story of the uh, windows on the cloister. Then to the third story. Imagine, if you will, wandering in the old quarter of a city somewhere in Europe. We've all done it. Narrow winding streets, no good for cars. Interesting little shops, all sorts of smells, the sun peeping through only from certain angles, and sooner or later you will come across the cathedral and a marketplace. Flowers, vegetables, cheeses, meats, handbags, jeans, souvenirs for tourists. Leave the noisy, bustling marketplace and enter the cathedral into a quieter, darker, quite different world. In medieval times, the priest, Thomas, spent much of his life within the church studying and going through the routines of worship and waiting for people to come through the doors for services. But the monk, Gregory, would often go out into the marketplace to spread some gospel kindness or maybe a little gospel fear. Those who went out regularly into the marketplace were called 
seculars. That's where our word comes from. It comes from the Latin word seculum, which means this present and temporal world. So a passing world. Thomas the priest and his brothers notice that when Gregory comes back into the cathedral from the marketplace, he has the muck of the marketplace on his sandals, the smell of the marketplace on his clothes, the language of the marketplace in his ears, and in truth, some of the values of the marketplace in his mind. The story of Gregory, the secular monk, affirms that as believers translate the gospel in the marketplace, they themselves inevitably become affected by it for good or ill. Between the church and the marketplace, there is always two-way traffic. Ultimately, Gregory's attempts at translation may become more like paraphrase. These three stories raise fundamental questions which anyone interested in translating the gospel to the modern world must face. These are questions about the so-called scandal of particularity, um, about absoluteness, about the universality of the claims of the gospel, about power, about whether being pure and truthful is compatible with being social. So these stories raise questions about the desirability, the possibility and the means of translation. Is it possible, is it doable um, to translate the gospel as we understand it to a secular world where the whole conceptual structure with which you and I operate simply doesn't exist in people's minds? How do you do it? First of all then, uh, and we're now through to number six, uh, I'm going to look at some examples of secular pluralism. Um, I could go in all kinds of directions here, I've chosen the ones that I know about best. Uh, as Christians, as Adventists, we would wish to say that a religious view of the world better describes the reality which is before us every day than does an, an account which eliminates God from the picture. But if we are to take the task of translation seriously, we must confront the robust claims of the secularists over recent centuries. And I mentioned just a few. First of all, the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume was quite clear about the matter. He said, the special claims of one religion or one charismatic leader, uh, special claims to revelation and in Hume's case particularly to miracle, uh, cancelled out rival claims leaving a residue of precisely nothing. So the, the miracle claims on behalf of Jesus are countered by the miracle claims uh, for some other uh, major religious leader uh, and they, they kind of they leave you with nothing. They cancel each other out. That was Hume's view. Religious pluralism, um, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and so on. Religious pluralism would leave the dispassionate observer to discount altogether any religious view of the world and to seek, as Hume did, an entirely empirical account of this world and of religious behaviour. Religions are local fictions which are not worthy of translation or transmission. Hume was quite clear about that. Um, Hume actually was a very urbane sort of person who uh, lived in Edinburgh, did his work in Edinburgh and had a difficult relationship with the church because he had many friends in the church. He paid a nominal um, allegiance or respect to it anyway. Um, and so you find that in his works about religion, he kind of he's, he's attempting all the, all the time to, dis, to demolish uh, Christian faith. And then you'll find on the last page very often there's a, a complete twist. He stands on his head in order to maintain respectability for his work. And it's significant that his most famous work, The Natural Dialogues, con uh, the Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, 
uh, were actually published three years after his death because he did want to create a lot of trouble with the church. That was David Hume. His position is little different from that of another Enlightenment figure, the Frenchman Denis Diderot, who scoffed that we are like, in fact, we are like human ants running over the face of the earth or claiming that our ant hill alone is precious to God. Now, uh, Diderot was one time editor of the great uh, Enlightenment manifesto, uh, L'Encyclopédie des Arts, des Sciences et des Métiers, or the Encyclopedia. Uh, this was an attempt by French intellectuals to put all in one place, um, 17 volumes, I think it was in the end, uh, all that was known to be true. And so, of course, that involved a judgment as to what was true. And he excluded all religious claims because they were not demonstrable in his view. Um, he dismissed religion as being um, dangerous, dangerous, culturally determined enthusiasm. That was the word that was used to dismiss religion and fiction. Interestingly enough, uh, the early origins of Adventism are in the Enlightenment. William Miller, uh, before he became converted, was deeply uh, influenced by the Enlightenment and I think you could uh, well argue that the whole uh, Adventist prophetic structure, with all, with all the detail you, you know very well, is actually comes out of an Enlightenment spirit. It's brought into Adventism by, uh, via William Miller. That's an interesting subject in itself. Um, and I don't think we've been aware of that, actually. The, de the developing scepticism of the 18th century paved the way for plural explanations of religious behaviour in the 19th century. Uh, Feuerbach argued that if God were a reality to birds, God would be a winged creature, a direct translation. Marx famously asserted that religion was an opiate to the oppressed poor, a fiction offering a way of coping with grinding poverty. Nietzsche proclaimed that God was dead, that Christianity had become a kind of Latin, a dead language of which translation was no longer needed. Freud later said that religion was an illusion based on the immature desire to return to the safety of a father's care. So for Freud, religion was simply autobiography. Uh, lives stand alone and are not comparable or translatable. Um, and so Freud dismissed uh, relig uh, religious claims as being false. In the 20th century, Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, sounds German, but he was British in fact, lived in Preston for a while, you can't get much more British than that. Um, he explained the plurality of belief in terms of playing our own language games. So, religions are like languages. They are not true or false. They are not good or bad. They, are, they just are the same way that Spanish just is. And so we speak Adventist or Catholic or Buddhist or Hindu um, in the same way that people speak Spanish. This is the language that we use to describe our world. We are Adventist in the same way that some people are French speakers. And there are many languages used to understand the world many dialects and many forms of discourse within one language, say within English, all kinds of private languages that, is, we, that many of us wouldn't understand. Computer language, for example, all of which have their own integrity. Lang but languages take a long time to learn and the fact is that most of us are too lazy to bother with them. Wittgenstein then, um, 20th century figure, that brings us to uh, postmodernism. Postmodernism gives us another look into pluralism. It's probably true that there are as many forms of postmodernism as there are postmodernists, uh, but many would agree that what distinguishes postmodernism is precisely the demand to engage with another worldview 
with a view to replacing it, with a view to deconstructing it, to use the jargon. So deconstruction is taking down a view of the world with a view to putting up another one which is better. I can think of no better physical symbol of that than the taking down of the Berlin Wall. That was physical deconstruction and it was also ideological deconstruction because here was communism, the ideology of communism being dismantled before our eyes. Extraordinary events for those of you who remember it. Um, and the project of deconstruction and reconstruction uh, go on, they take place uh, ad infinitum. Thus, in, in uh, postmodernism, engagement is necessary. Uh, and in pluralism, it's not. In pluralism, uh, things, ideas can just carry on on parallel lines and they need never touch. Postmodernism at its best demands that ideas come together and are subject to scrutiny. Postmodernism means the end of history, of culture, of the book, of the self and of God as concepts which in some way uh, unify our experience. All of those five that I've mentioned there offer comprehensive unifying force. Uh, as such, they are exclusive and often oppressive uh, and thus not fit for the purpose of living in the modern world. For example, um, feminism was uh, an attempt to deconstruct uh, an entirely male view of the world. Um, uh, the civil rights movement was an, an attempt to deconstruct the white man's story uh, and so on. All of the human rights movements are forms of deconstruction to create a, a different story, a different world. Um, Pluralism, pluralism then is akin to that form of multiculturalism where there are many, where many ethnic styles coexist without ever touching or influencing each other. So some live in the inner city, some live in the suburbs, some live in the countryside. They really rarely meet and they are perfectly happy with this state of minimalist coexistence. So. Um, People who live in Windsor are more than happy if they never have to cross the barrier, which is the M4, and encounter the people who live in Slough. Okay. Windsor and Slough never meet. Um, and people in Windsor and the people in Slough are perfectly happy with that. Um, it's just pluralist coexistence. They don't touch. Postmodernism demands a, a certain amount of uh, uh, coming together. Some people would maintain that this form of um, multiculturalism is in fact not multiculturalism, it's mere internationalism and that true multiculturalism uh, really doesn't exist unless the various cultures do engage with each other in some sort of way, as for example in Reading. Well, you're, you're well aware of many forms of, of secular pluralism uh, and I won't uh, elaborate any more. Uh, under secular pluralism, at best, the gospel is simply one phenomenon amongst others. At worst, it's a kind of virus uh, which will one day be eliminated. No translation for the secular pluralist is necessary. Okay then, to the second uh, section, uh, and the sections get shorter, you'll be glad to know. Uh, religious pluralism. I'm going to assume on your part a, a section that I had here which describes conservative Christians. It's really based on Acts chapter 4 verse 18 uh, which says there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. So announcing, proclaiming the supremacy of Jesus Christ. It's John chapter 1 verse eight, 18. It is, uh, it is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. That kind of approach uh, we as Adventists uh, would fall within this particular uh, conservative approach to Christianity. As, as a way of a reality check, uh, we need to look at some people who've questioned that point of view. Uh, and I'm going to go to the work of uh, one man who perhaps more than any in this country uh, dealt with this head on, largely because he was um, 
a teacher at the University of Birmingham, and Birmingham um, has been a multicultural city for a very long time. Um, and he's written a number of ways in which we can approach this question of the um, the absolutist claims which are made by Christianity on the other hand and the, the fact of a burgeoning world population, seven billion and growing, uh, and also the fact that we know more about that because of improved uh, translation and uh, of uh, growing migration. Uh, Hicks written a great deal about this. He argues, for example, on one occasion, that sometimes we just we simply experience the world as different things. So he gives an he gives an example. As you walk along a forest path, as darkness falls, you see ahead of you in the distance what you think is another human being coming towards you. On the path, your camp, your companion, the person you're walking with, thinks it's not a person but a bush. It's, it's twilight, you can't see clearly, so you're just trying to distinguish some kind of shape. Another 200 metres of the walk shows you both to be wrong. It is, in fact, a sign on the footpath. Hick also put forward the idea of eschatological verification. That means that we all proceed along our life's path with our varying perceptions of the landscape which surrounds us. Finally, with our journey completed, we shall see things as they truly are. But such knowledge is only accessible as we round the final bend in the road and see that some were right and some were wrong. There are two of um, Hick's attempts to deal uh, with this, and I think it's fair to say that Hick was a universalist. Um, Another American academic who uh, addressed this head on and actually gave his book the title No Other Name, question mark, 1985, Paul Knitter, uh, all these works in the library, by the way, um, he produced an extensive critique of Christian attitudes towards other religions. And here's just a few of the options that he offers. Number one, uh, that there is indeed only salvation through Jesus Christ. But God speaks in many different accents. There is a general stirring of, the, of God's spirit in the world that Jesus is truly one, the one and only Son of God. Christ's atoning work is of paramount importance for every human being. But all religions are preparatory to Christianity and none bring in, uh, salvation in and of themselves. But God is at work in other religions. Christianity is radically different from but not discontinuous from other religions. Those who are saved are saved through Jesus, though they, have may, they may never have heard his name. Translation then remains an important activity uh, under this uh, view of the world. That's the first one. Salvation is only through Jesus, but people may not know that they are saved through Jesus. They may even not know the name. Secondly, uh, this assumes that the message of the New Testament, um, that while the, the message of the New Testament may be Christocentric, the language of Jesus himself, rather than the Apostle Paul uh, or even the Gospel writers, the language of Jesus himself was theocentric and it was the early church which brought us the, the view of Jesus that we have generally operated with. This, uh, this point of view would say that uh, actually none of the images of, the, of, of Jesus in the New Testament are absolute. Jesus was a son of God. Uh, the eschaton, the end, did not materialise even as Jesus himself had expected. Jesus was a man who was radically human and radically open to God. And a commitment to Jesus is not necessarily a commitment of other religious ways. The main weakness of this position is that it, uh, it means that the res resurrection becomes surplus to requirements and not the very heart of faith as we would hold. But under this view, which good many people hold, no urgent act of translation is necessary. A third view comes from the work of um, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, and he says that actually we all have a common psychic origin and an inner energy waiting for uh, realisation. 
we are all, we are all uh, naturally religious, we have spiritual aspirations, and we are addressed by some what he calls archetypes, like the Divine Mother, the Dying God, the Young Virgin, the Hero Saviour, the Cunning Devil, the Hidden Treasure. All of, all of those ideas are not peculiar to Christianity. You find them appearing in many other religious um, stories. Man is naturally religion, religious. God expresses himself in many languages and so we are not responsible for translation services and translation actually may be harmful. God is not separable from the self. Jesus was the highest expression of, mature, of the mature spiritual self. And God shows himself present by bringing wholeness, peace, willingness to accept responsibility uh, for action and so on. God comes to us via our minds. The incarnation was not, nece was not necessary. Uh, it's one step from this, this is number four, one step from this to saying, uh, from, from saying that all personal religious experiences are the same, one step from that to saying that all religions are the same. So you're going from personal to corporate, that they have a common essence um, different beliefs, practices, languages cannot conceal the same core in all religions that the universe is mysterious, that only absolute reality can bring meaning to our lives, that the divine presence is good um, uh, and brings peace and harmony. But creed and code and cult may differ hugely for cultural reasons. So. No exclusivism is possible or necessary, but we only get to the universal by the particular. So um, the scandal of particularity, that there's only salvation in Jesus, has got its own uh, uses. It's not a useless idea. And so translation here becomes important for better mutual understanding en route. The last view, and Nitta does have more than this, but let me just uh, mention one last one. <laughs> The last um, view that uh, is this, and it's kind, of, it's kind of got Jewish origins, and that is uh, that a truly religious response is to be found uh, in doing, not in knowing. In other words, we do the truth. We don't know the truth, we do the truth. And since um, this is typical of the Jewish tradition in which Christianity has its roots, we need to take notice of this. I don't know if you remember that uh, rabbi who came to Newbold uh, for the Beach Lecture a little while ago. I don't know if you remember the quest answer, question and answer <coughs> session, but it was quite clear, uh, I think, that the kinds of questions that which were coming from a Christian audience were, were regarded by the Jewish lecturer as being uh, kind of a bit off beam and really not quite the right questions. Do you remember that? Um, um, he was not in the least bothered by Dawkins in the same way that we might be. So for, for the, in the Jewish mind you do the truth, you don't know the truth. Uh, and that means uh, that you live happily with paradox, it means you can go and listen to other people's views and come back and bring some value from it. It uh, tends to be prophetic in nature. Um, and it's not all that far from this Jewish idea that doing comes be, uh, that, that the truth is in doing and not in believing or knowing. It's not that far away from the, one of the latest Christian emergent church catchphrases that belonging comes before believing. It's not that far away from it. The gospel, under this account anyway, is translated supremely into action. It's action that does the translation. So there, that's uh, some options under religious pluralism. M moving quickly to um, Christian pluralism. Um, conservative Christians such as ourselves would struggle to see that any of what I've just said uh, offers a particularly good way of understanding religious difference. And so I come now very briefly to Christian pluralism and as I understand it, it is the official teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that our church offers the final and purest refinement of Christian teaching and discipleship over against, say, Lutheranism or orthodoxy. Um, 
I'm going to move quickly over this because the differences between com Christian communities of faith are often uh, rehearsed in uh, our Adventist communities. And indeed, our resistance to liturgical, Pentecostal and spiritualist churches is part of the way that we have historically tried to identify ourselves and create a kind of niche. And perhaps this explains why those Adventists who engage in uh, ecumenical conversations are treated with a measure of uh, suspicion, Harry. Is that not true? Um, certainly if you talk to Burt Beach about that, uh, he's got all kinds of stories. He's, he's been regarded as a Jesuit over the years because he's got a medal from the Pope and all of that sort of thing. So uh, under a, an Adventist view of the world, ecumen ecumenism is a... Um, a dangerous sort of area. Uh, we, are ner we are nervous of those who speak uh, the same language but use a, a particular dialect. So there are close to uh, a thousand officially recognised expressions of Christianity, 950 or so, and there are many, many more uh, unofficial outcrops. Uh, and differences are, are um, often discourteous um, between Christian groups, sometimes even violent, and they're based on all kinds of doctrinal, historical, liturgical and political differences. Uh, in the language of translations, we Adventists, I think, would like to see ourselves as the authoritative New Revised Standard Version. Uh, we want to be new, but we want to be standard. Um, um, new Revised Standard Version is supposed to be the most reliable. That's what our department says anyway. Or if we want to change the metaphor, uh, the Adventist church is a little bit like the Académie Française, uh, which was established in 1635 to protect the purity of the French language uh, from all kinds of intrusions from other languages, like the Anglicisms, le parking, terrible French word. Um, or uh, more recently, the, the, French, the Académie Française tried to, to insist on the word le courriel for email. Uh, it didn't work, um, but they tried. Um, so an attempt to, the, to preserve the purity of something, um, uh, whether religious or linguistic. Um, finally then, to the question of Adventist pluralism. This is where it got a little bit more um, heated when I was um, doing this in Beirut. Um, it may be that our own experience of Adventist pluralism will inform our conversation about pluralism generally. Re recognising maybe with some regret that even our own Adventist community of faith is fragmented, we may actually wish to say that the particular point at which uh, I locate myself, you locate yourself across the very, very broad spectrum of Seventh-day Adventist Christianity. We quite often want to say that my point on the spectrum is the best point, don't we? Um, some would even argue that it's difficult to talk today about Seventh-day Adventism, rather that there are many Seventh-day Adventisms um, we might be reluctant to, concede, reluctant to concede that, um, but uh, Seventh-day Adventism in some expressions is very different animal from that in other expressions. You know that by experience, I'm sure. There are many questions of doctrine, per church politics, finance, evangelism style, lifestyle, ethics, worship style, church order, cultural accretions, leadership style and membership, which all divide us. We are, as Adventists, perhaps centrally united by our celebration of the, of the Sabbath, as Catholics are united by the celebration of the Mass. The question is, is this enough to hold us together over the, um, as a unity as fractures in the Adventist Church over authority, hermeneutics, ordination, worship threatened to divide us? Will we hold together? Well, we've held it together for 150 years um, so far without major schism. That's not a bad achievement in itself. Uh, we will be able to continue. You know and I know uh, Adventists from another part of the Adventist f family, uh, if we can call it that. Uh, you know people who call themselves Adventists and are part of our 
your Adventist family who are both irritating uh, and resistant to our own ideals for the church. Uh, they are as um, irritating as that estranged uncle that you might meet at Christmas. Um, you, know, you know he's the same family. You have to pay due respect to him because he's the same family, but you're very glad that you don't have to see him more than once a year. You know, you know I'm talking about. Um, how do we, even in this room, I don't know, there's probably 30 or 40 of us here tonight, how do we, uh, representing, I would think, probably different places on the Adventist spectrum, how do we speak to each other, to our fellow Adventists? How do we translate the gospel to each other? And the question that I posed in Beirut, which was a little uncomfortable, was uh, how do Adventist academics engage with each other? When on the one hand, you've got the Adventist Theological Society, which is conservative and straight down the line. How do they engage with the Adventist Society for Religious Studies, which is rather uh, probably centre-left, um, um, rather more open? How, sometimes they barely speak to each other. Uh, and find it difficult to hold joint meetings. If we can't do it for each other, how can we possibly do it to a wider audience? Um, the difficulties that we experience in the act of translation amongst ourselves may suggest that there's no easy way of doing it successfully beyond the borders of the church. Uh, so to the conclusion, I have... Um, 11 points of conclusion. Um, they are what I think to be the case. You may disagree. Uh, number one, Leslie Newbegin, who was a bishop of the Church of India, a long time missionary in India, um, is quite clear that we must not domesticate or neuter the gospel by trying to align it with prevailing wisdom in our own or other societies. Um, that way lies death, relativism. In scripture, something is given which cannot be derived from other sources. Uh, I think he's right about that. Secondly, the simple willingness to accept a plurality of values, cultural norms and religious dogma leads to what Alan Bloom famously called in his book of the same title, the closing of the American mind. Um, and his main argument in that book is this. If you are simply willing to say, and you hear this all the time, this is true for me, this is true for me, or people say this is good for me, it's true for me. If you say that, then you are saying that all views are equally acceptable. And if you believe that, then all intellectual, intellectual rigour is, is immediately lost. You don't need to argue and criticise and subject, subject your view to scrutiny if it's all equally as good. Uh, and uh, Bloom was worried uh, when he published the book that, uh, that intellectual rigour was being lost in America. Um, views and values need to be open for scrutiny and criticism. And I should say at this point that uh, liberals, so-called liberals, uh, can just as effectively close a group's mind as conservatives. And both are ca equally capable of it. Thirdly, uh, Peter Berger, um, uh, social commentator, says that what we call a rational view of the world is only really a plausibility structure. It's a work in progress uh, which allows us to live our lives in a more or less predictable world. So it's a, you kind of put a structure and interpretation on life. He calls it a plausibility structure. But what is plausible changes with advances in knowledge and so the structures have to be modified and even dismantled. For the Christian, the Jesus story is a better way of understanding life than the, pre than, than the prevalent secularist, humanist, plausibility structure. Uh, it will for us always remain, however, the case that when anom anomalies appear in our own faith, we may need the spiritual courage to, act in, to engage in an act of retranslation. Uh, new discoveries are taking place in the world about the, the universe, about DNA and so on, which make us, need to make us think again. We shouldn't be afraid to do it. 
Number four, again back to Newbegin, he says that we are all called to um, indwell our story. It means that I must have a deep sense that the Christian story is a clue to my own story as an individual. So I have to live within, I have to live my life within the Adventist plausibility structure, but I also have to live my life within the British plausibility structure, and I somehow have to make them speak to each other uh, in my own being. I am not satisfied with an Adventist view of the world which fails to take into consideration all those things which are taking place in the culture of which I'm a part. I have to do that with vigour and integrity. I believe the church should do the same. Five, the danger facing a global church such as ours, which boasts churches in what, over 200 countries, may be that there is no adequate conversation with, uh, with the culture, with local plausibility structures. If you have a personal story to tell, and we emphasize that all of the time, personal relationship with Jesus. If you have a personal story to tell, it must be your story and not a karaoke story not a pre-packaged story with a label on the side which says made in the USA. And I have seen many people leaving the church or declining eventually to join because they rather regret the fact that the church's pl plausibility structure is just not strong enough to support the weight of their demanding lives, either in the big things of life, um, like bereavement, or in the smaller day-to-day -day things. Um, it's as if um, we are skating on the surface of a pond which is frozen over and, and it was, the ice is just, the Adventist ice is just not strong enough to hold us. And I, I'm, on the whole, people who leave the church don't do, don't do so uh, um, happily. They do so sadly. They wish they could find a way of staying, but they can't. Number six, uh, in a global church, there's a tendency always to, re to revert to a lowest common denominator. Uh, lowest con common denominator language, which simply does not translate well uh, locally. The best way of illustrating that is through the songs that we sing. You know, you go anywhere in the world and people will still be singing Majesty. Dreadful song. Um, you know, uh, and uh, it changes, but there's this kind of... Um, lowest common denominator approach to language, which doesn't allow uh, nuance, local nuance and cultural difference to be taken into consideration. Seven, the great missionary proclama proclamations of the books of the Acts, of the, of the book of the Acts of the Apostles come in response to, to the questions being asked by the local people, not at the initiative of the apostles. Mission is above all about faithful communities which flourish by living a story and I believe that we need churches which are, which are embedded in the wider local community rather than what we often have which is ghettos of believers in one place or another or commuter churches um, where people go to find their preferred way of worshipping. Uh, and in neither case, uh, neither in the case of ghetto churches or commuter churches, in neither case is there very much contact with the host community. The church has to learn to embody the, the gospel in its own culture without that culture distorting of this. And all of this implies a costly identification uh, and involvement uh, with others. And I fear, I, this is a confession on my part as well, I fear, it was certainly true in the room that when I said this in Beirut, that all of us are too involved in our work to be a lively part of the community which surrounds the place where we work or where we live or where we worship. We're just too busy. Number eight brings me to the contemporary Christian thinker John Milbank. He's part of the theology department at the University of Nottingham and he's, been ma he's made some ripples over the past 10 years on this whole question. And in 1999 he wrote a book called Radical Orthodoxy. He uses a postmodern approach uh, to issue a very strong critique of liberalism and pluralism and to call us back to uh, our orthodoxy. Um, he says that we have 
translated our orthodoxy into something much less than radical. He says that radical orthodoxy is much more threatening to traditional orthodoxy than liberalism. We need a radical orthodoxy. Uh, and he says some other uh, rather politically incorrect things. He says that interfaith dialogue is often futile and it can produce some very anemic results because the conversation is often about rather neutral subjects where there's hope of agree agreement uh, rather than ra more um, uh, controversial subjects. And then he goes on to say this rather surprisingly, those from different faith traditions or different parts of the same tradition should not be seeking to agree with each other we should rather be seeking to acknowledge that we, tr we, tr we, we all treat each other with mutual suspicion. What we should be doing is seeking to surprise each other with compellingly lucid insights into our own tradition. So we should be going deep down into our own tradition and finding newness there, not trying to make kind of weak bridges between communities. Following him, we would have to say that we need to go not, not to go away from Adventism, but deep into it, uh, as if to revisit it as, for the f uh, as if for the first time, to question and be questioned, and to be prepared to be disturbed from the complacency of our often rehearsed answers. Um, eight, Brian McLaren uh, provides us with a further clue in the title of his book, A Generous Orthodoxy. Translation is best done with a warm and, welcome, uh, warm and open welcome to our own orthodoxy, which has sus sustained us so well. Uh, and it's an orthodoxy which listens carefully to any incomers. Nine, a fuller expression of this is to be found in the work of Luke Bretherton. He's at King's in London at the moment, in a book called Hospitality as Holiness. He says, when you come across a stranger, who is in many ways quite other than you, you can welcome them to your home, you can offer hospitality, food, drink, the opportunity to wash themselves and so on. But you can also offer them an open mind uh, to extend to them the hospitality of really listening to them, which is a very rare gift these days. And as they offer their own story, so, so different from your own, you can open your heart to them as well. And eventually you realise that while you offered them hospitality, they also brought gifts, less tangible but real benefits to you as well. Strangers always bring gifts. That is clear biblical teaching. Strangers always bring gifts. Mere tolerance of plurality, which is pluralism, is not enough. The biblical alternative is hospitality. The guest becomes part of the household for a brief while. Someone is owed hospitality just because she is a stranger. And I use she deliberately because that opens up a whole different vista on, uh, on, ad, on otherness, uh, which I will ignore here, but which our church cannot afford to. Um, how long can we deny full hospitality? to our Adventist sisters in Christ. That's a, I'm making a plea of our ordination. Um, I just hope that the present process um, is an honest one. The hospitable home maintains its identity, but does not coerce the visitor. Neither does it remain quite as it, the same as it was before she came. The, cha the strangers visit in response to our hospitality, has changed something for good. God's Spirit helps us to be with our hosts without being, uh, uh, God's Spirit helps us to be with our visitors without being overrun by them, which is what I think we most fear. And I think at the bottom of this whole debate is, the, is fear. Um, we are afraid of the incursions of others on our lives and on our view of the world. But we serve the one who says uh, love casts out fear, the one who constantly is telling us, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. 
Jesus celebrated with aliens. Jesus' hospitality was shocking to the guardians of the traditions because it threatened the traditional pu purity of Israel. The, str the interesting thing is that Jesus acknowledges that there's a tension between holiness and hospitality and he does not try to resolve it. Benedictine monasteries in the medieval period would have a monk posted at the door ready to welcome any stranger who might come by. That was his job, to welcome people who, who came for uh, a night's sleep and so on. To welcome them to receive the benefits of life together. Hospitality, hospital, hospice. Maybe the hospice movement has something to teach the church. In hospices all are actively welcomed whatever terminal disease they have. All are given the opportunity to engage with the most important experience of their lives. Withdrawal is not an option for the church. Assimilation is not an option for the church. Warfare is not an option for the church. Hospitality is the only option uh, <coughs> because the gospel is the great story of God's costly hospitality to us. And lastly, you'll see I come to the last and uh, most difficult of questions which I hesitated to address uh, because it's not a philosophical question really, it's a personal question. In macrocosm we live in a plural world. In microcosm we live in plural families. So my question uh, for all of us, myself included, is this. How have we managed the business of translating the gospel to our own families, to our spouses, and perhaps more, most specifically and most poignantly uh, to our own adult children? How have we managed to translate the gospel to the next generation, to our own flesh and blood? For some of us, this is a painful question, and it's absolutely not for anybody outside the family circle to judge. Uh, and we may well reflect and conclude and regret that much has been lost in translation in that particular process. But I think this highly personal question may be helpful in allowing us to address the, the larger question truthfully. Uh, and I believe that unless we are prepared honestly to face this particular question, anything else which might be said on this particular subject is merely footnote. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>